Good morning, friends. Thank you for joining me this morning. Um, we're starting a new book today, which is rather exciting. I've really enjoyed our time in the prophets so far. So far, let's count them. We've looked at Jonah, we have looked at Amos, and we are now, and we have looked at Hosea. And that's actually chronological order. So the first of the prophetic books to be written, we think, was Jonah. Um, the second that we think was written was um, Amos and then Hosea. Now the next book that we're getting to is just, it's in chronological order. It's the book of Micah. But it's also a little bit different because Micah was a contemporary. Some Many of these guys were close to contemporaries of each other. But we know for sure that Micah was writing at the same time as Isaiah. Now, Isaiah is the book that we're doing in our sermon series currently, and you can follow, find all of those on our church's Facebook page at Douglastown Community Church on Facebook. So those are there if you want to watch them and hear our, uh, uh, what's going on in the book of Isaiah, and we'll do Isaiah here as well. But I thought that since we're in the headspace right now to kind of look at some of these minor prophets, meaning not one of the big three, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, uh, that we would focus on Micah. Now, Micah is in many ways a lot like the prophet Amos. By saying that, I mean that he is a prophet from the um, from Judah who has gone to the northern tribes to speak and to warn them. Now, he comes in really like a wrecking ball. He comes in saying right off the bat, this is the word of the Lord. And he comes in with um, great warning concerning Samaria. And then he speaks to Jerusalem as well. So remember just a little bit of history. At this point, uh, the time of um, Isaiah and Micah, and the, the, it's the two divided kingdoms. You have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom has really been deeply involved in idol worship and Baal worship. We heard a lot about that with Hosea as well. Uh, just the, his God's own passionate pleading with his people to turn their backs on their idols and to return to him. Now, uh, the, the North Southern tribes have also been in and off and on involved in idol worship. And, but there's a frequency where every few kings, you'll have several good kings, then you'll have a bad one. But the good kings, they, they tend to clean out the idolatry. And they tend to focus things on temple worship. So bringing people back to the temple and to the worship of Yahweh. But now we come to Micah, and Micah is looking at the northern kingdom, and he comes in, and he's going to do two things. And in the four days that we're going to spend on Micah, we're going to see uh, kind of this dual focus. On one hand, he comes in warning the people of Israel, strongly warning the people of Israel. And then he's going to come in, and he's going to offer them a, a, a hope of repentance, saying, Look, this is what God can do for those who repent. And we're going to see that warning and call to repentance and warning and call to repentance back and forth through the whole song, uh, through the whole, uh, what's the word for it, through the whole prophetic book. Now, one other thing about this book, it is very much like a psalm. There's a lot, it's all poetry. It's all written with a mind towards capturing our imagination and using satiric and beautiful language to challenge us and to emotionally feel God's desire for us to turn and to repent. So today we're going to read chapter 1 of Micah. So open up in your Bibles if you'd like, or you can just uh, follow along with me. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Morsheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear you peoples, all of you. Pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it. Let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place, and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. All this is the transgression of Jacob. All this is for the transgression of Jacob. And for the sins of the house of Israel. So remember, Jacob was the original um, father of the 12 tribes of Israel that back in the book of Genesis. And God changed his name to Israel, 
who, which is the name that the ten tribes remaining bear, Israel or Samaria. God also likes to refer to them as Ephraim. So there's all these different kind of code names that are used in the, in the prophets to describe these nations, this one nation. And what now he moves on and he says, what is the... Um, what is the transgression of Jacob? Jacob, is it not Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap in the open country, a place for planting vineyards. And I will pour down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces and all her wages shall be burned with fire. And all her idols I will lay waste for from the fee of a prostitute she gathered them. To the fee of a prostitute they shall return. And for this I will lament and wail. I will go stripped and naked. I will make lamentation like the jackals and mourning like the ostriches. For her womb is, wound is incurable and it has come to Jacob. It has reached the gate of my people to Jerusalem itself. Tell it not in Gath, weep not at all. In Bethlehem, roll yourselves in dust. Pass on your way, inhabitants of Shapir. In nakedness and shame, in the inhabitants of Zan, do not come out. The lamentation of Beth Ezel shall take away from you its standing place. For the inhabitants of Marth wait anxiously for good, because disaster has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. Harness the steeds to the chariots, inhabitants of Lachish. It was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, for in you were found the transgressions of Israel. Therefore you shall give parting gifts to Morsheth Gath. The houses of Akshib shall be a deceitful thing to the kings of Israel. I will again bring a conqueror to you, inhabitants of Marsha. The glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. Make yourselves bald and cut off your hair. For the children of your delight, make yourselves as bald as the eagle. For they shall go from you into exile. And I'm just going to read a few verses of chapter 2 because he focuses in a little more on the transgressions of Israel there. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Therefore, just thus says the Lord, Behold, against this family I am devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks, and you shall not walk haughtily. For it will be a time of disaster. In that day they shall take up a taunt song against you and moan bitterly. And say, We are utterly wounded. He changes the portion of my people, how he removes it from me. To an apostate he allots our fields. Therefore you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. So, here's what we've got going on. One second, let me... Uh, we have a, a warning message to the tribes of Israel, and it's a heavy one, right? It begins with this image of God entering our plane in this very terrifying way. This image of God coming down from his holy temple to tread on the high places of the earth, to crush them down, to split the valleys open like wax, to cause them to pour out before the heat of his fury. And why is that? Why is God the day of the Lord coming? Now, the day of the Lord was considered to be a day of judgment. So when God came, he came to right wrongs and to bring righteousness to bear. It was something that people looked forward to. But at the same time, if you were wicked, it was something you were definitely supposed to fear. And uh, Micah says that the people who should fear are the trans uh, is Samaria and the high place of Judah. Why is that? Because of the brokenness that they... Bear. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces. All her wages shall be burned by the fire. All her idols I will wait, lay to waste. For from the fee of a prostitute she gathered them. So again, we see that and we can see that reference right away to Hosea who came first and said that Israel is like a prostitute. And we get that imagery there and apply it here and we understand that the fee of the prostitute, that Israel's wealth comes about because she has not obeyed God. And so God's going to take it from her. And not only we see in the rest of this chapter, but the rest of these verses with these nations and lands, those aren't Israelite or Judah. Most of them aren't from Israel or Judah. Those names are names of cities that are going to take slaves from Israel. 
names of Sid places where Israelites will go as slaves um, when God crushes them and when God causes them to um, be destroyed. And then verse 16 in chapter 1 has this, this ringing warning. Make yourselves bald and cut off your hair for the children of your delight. Make yourselves as bald as the eagle for they shall go from you into exile. I wonder, eagle, make yourself as bald as the eagle. I bet you, I'd do more research, but I bet you that actually the bird that they're talking about there is closer to a vulture, but that's just my guess. I'll have to look into that, but animals are really tricky in the Old Testament. Anyways, um, what you, because bald eagles are kind of a North American thing. You get that? Anyways, totally off the topic and in my own weird headspace, but the image that we have here is the image of God once again with terrifying language of judgment and wrath, warning the people of Israel of their need to repent. And as I'm thinking about this, because my head's between the book of Isaiah and this and our other prophetic books, my head is just right in this space, in this period, the what we call the 8th century BC, when all this was being done. And you get this sense that God was pleading anxiously and warning them anxiously about what was going to happen. Israel was doomed, and, but they had every opportunity to repent. It's like when my son is screaming and temper tantruming, and we warn him. We say, you know what? If you continue down this road, you're going to lose game time. And we warn him quite a few times. We try to calm him down and warn him quite a few times. But if he continues down that road, at the end, when he loses the game time, he'll come back and he'll say, well, you didn't tell me. And of course, that's what we did so many times. And this is God the Father speaking to Israel, warning them with hopes that they will repent. And that's what these prophetic books call us to do, to recognize our sin, to turn from it, and to repent. For us, the warning stands to reason that um, uh, we too need to repent, that there's um, a repentance from idolatry, that there's a repentance from trusting in um the power of man from trusting in the praise of people rather than the praise of God, for trusting in um, the idols of man, money, power, religion, all of these things that we look to to say, this is what will make me strong, this is what will fill me up, um, our careers, um, the, the way people like us even. These things can become idols to us. And we need to pause in the midst of all this and say, you know what? There's only one who can truly satisfy. And Micah's going to get to that as well as he invites the people of Israel to turn and to repent. For us, we have this wonderful bonus in that when we look to repent, we turn and we see Christ, uh, the Son of Man who was slain, seen at the right hand of the throne of God, and we're reminded of his kindness and his love and his power to redeem us. We're reminded of um, God's great plan of redemption, which we have in Scripture laid out for us. And we're going to see more of that as well in the book of Micah. So now um, I want to know what you think. Are you, uh, how are you enjoying the prophetic books and how are you enjoying even our dive into Micah now? Uh, are you beginning to get a sense of some of the familiar themes of, in the prophetic books, how they all work to reason? Um, what God's doing in all of them and how they are woven together into one historical unit. Uh, that's what I'm hoping that we can begin to see as we walk through these. I hope as well that you're seeing that these books aren't all just doom and gloom. But at the same time, there is a lot of warning here. And if you're exhausted by all of these prophetic books, let me know. Hit me with an email or a message or a comment. If you're just saying, you know what, I need a break. Um, let's do something a little bit more cheerful. Um, that's fine too. Uh, we can always pause the series if it's feeling overwhelming and do something else and come back. But I'd love to know how you're doing as you walk down this road with me. Now let's pray. Father, we praise you on this day as we enter into yet another uh, book that contains your word written to us, the word of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, written that we might hear and humble ourselves and obey. Father, we lift up our nation nations plural depending on who's watching this and we pray father for your peace to go before us and we pray for your justice to shine out and we know that in a nation that is broken 
We need leaders who will repent and we need, and well, the church to repent and be an obvious example of what it looks like to walk humbly before you. We know the history of Samaria was that the church frequently, and Judah, the church frequently, the temple frequently led people into apostasy. apostasy. And we pray, Father, that we would not do that as we walk before you. Give us humble hearts as we point to the glory of the Lamb that was slain, the Lion of Judah, our King of kings and Lord of lords. And Father, we pray for those that are mourning today. We pray particularly for Colette, and we pray for um, others who are hurting. May your peace and your strength be with them. May you heal them and draw them near to you. And we thank you for this day. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me today. I hope that you have a beautiful rest of your day. Bye-bye.